Members and friends of the John Birch Society, good afternoon. And our subject this afternoon is no easy way. That title points to a principle which is fundamental in our whole enterprise. For 15 years ago, the John Birch Society formed its first chapters, and we set out to do our part towards winning this struggle on behalf of Americanism against communism. Basing our outlook on the precepts of history, the lessons of experience, and the conclusions of logic, we took education as our total strategy and truth as our only weapon. We believed that exposure and the effects of exposure as materialized by public opinion and political action, if carried out far enough and fast enough, was something that no conspiracy could withstand. This was a new kind of opposition that the communists had never faced before on any sizable, organized, and permanent basis in any of the countries which they had already taken over. All of the indoctrination and propaganda which served as education during the conflict in these various countries had always been exerted on behalf of the left. It had played a mighty part in bringing about the frightening sequence of communist successes. It had usually enabled the conspirators through the confusion and treachery and divisiveness thus imposed on their enemies to overcome all of the military or political resistance which could be mustered against them. While how much the insiders of the master conspiracy feared the possibility of such exposure if truthful information about themselves should thereby be conveyed to a significant percentage of the American people was made crystal clear in just one episode. This was the massive and sinister campaign to destroy Senator Joseph McCarthy. He set out to use exposure as a way of fighting him. We are convinced today, more than ever before, that on entering the arena, we had chosen the right approach. In fact, the only approach to this struggle with the insiders and their communist dupes, which had any chance of success. But we were starting almost from scratch. There were a few individuals and small organizations already at work, thank goodness, in miscellaneous efforts to expose various parts of the collectivist movement so far as they understood it. But in comparison with these embryonic allies, and in view of the fact that even some of them were deceptive phonies, just consider the strength and nature of the hostile forces that we faced. Already hard at work, on the side of the communist advance, were the successive administrations in Washington and many increasingly huge bureaucratic agencies of our government. Also in the same category were most of the press and the broadcasting media, a preponderant part of our whole educational system, a huge percentage of the clergy in almost all denominations, almost the entire entertainment field, and prestigious infiltrators into the top levels of practically all other important divisions of our national life. What is more, their strategy had been meticulously determined for all of these agents and opportunistic dupes of the conspiracy by the insiders at the top, long before the George Birch Society came into existence. The pattern followed in the United States was simply the implementation of a long-tested and worldwide policy. On the positive side, this strategy called for the constant glorification of communism as a way of life and the tremendous buildup as great heroes and patriots and humanitarians of the most important pro-communist traitors to their respective countries. For this purpose, so much propaganda of so many kinds was sent on its way from so many different sources that there was an increasing acceptance of more and more communist pretenses as bona fide on the part of millions of readers and listeners, so that most attempts at exposure could be rendered futile by the sheer disbelief and incipient hostility of the misinformed. On the negative or defensive side, the same purpose was carried out through a very clever stratagem, which was uniformly adopted. No conspirator, high or low, was ever to try to refute the allegations as to the falsehoods, the deceptions, treason, malice, and crimes through which communist pretenses and designs were being propagated. This was because it would be entirely impossible to bring out any convincing reputation to the reasonably level-headed and well-informed observers. Also, any such effort would merely draw wider attention to the charges. So the standard procedure of the conspirators instead was to ignore the accusations 
but destroy the accuser. For this would not only discredit, to some extent, the allegations which had been made by the victims of those vicious attacks, but it would serve to silence other enemies who might otherwise have the courage to come out and spread the truth. It was in accordance with this master design that in the fall of 1960, Nikita Khrushchev decreed that any man or any organization who or which persisted in being aggressively and effectively anti-communist should be subjected to, quote, all the torments of hell, unquote. And that in December of the same year, a directive was issued from Moscow, almost entirely because of the activities of the John Birch Society, that all anti-communist organizations had to be destroyed. The slaves of the Communist Party line, especially in the United States, certainly tried to carry out those instructions, with the result that, as was later confirmed by published hearings of the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee, practically the whole brunt of that directive was borne by the John Birch Society. Not only did this vicious strategy work extremely well, even in 1960 and 1961, when we were getting started, but the forces of the pressures which the faithful pro-communists could use for that purpose were turned against us steadily for the next few years, until in the fall of 1965 and the spring of 1966, the open attacks on the society from the most powerful governmental sources and the undercover undermining of the society by skillful manipulators in very high places made the insiders feel that we had been fatally wounded and would gradually fade away. And their attitude was justified through the fact that by the summer of 1966, our growth in membership had shrunk from around 10 new chapters per day to about one new chapter per week. But fortunately, these dominant members of the conspiracy were up against a new form of opposition which they still failed to understand. So, while we were set back tremendously by these five years of unceasing efforts to destroy us, we did still survive. Not only that, but through shifting our own emphasis from recruitment of new members to the formation of ad hoc committees and the expansion of our educational program, by the end of the next five years, we had multiplied our strength and reach and effectiveness at least by four. And, to our further good fortune, these extremely brilliant and usually realistic conspirators appeared to be blissfully and optimistically unaware of what was happening. Until, in another three years, we could state with honest conviction that the chances of our eventually winning this struggle had gradually moved from about 10 to 1 against us a dozen years ago to a level where the objective odds today seem to us to be approximately even. But those present chances presuppose the condition that our membership, our staff, and our management will all work for the next 15 years, and especially for the five years immediately ahead of the present crucial crisis, with the same vigor, courage, and determination that have brought us face to face with so tremendous an opportunity. And the purpose of this excursion into comparatively ancient history has been simply to drive home the fact that our progress has not been easy. It has taken almost superhuman confidence, sacrifice, level-headedness, and persistence on the part of the finest body of men and women in the world today. Now, there may be a tendency by all of us some of the time, and by some of us all of the time, to brush aside that last assertion as just so much pretty and exaggerated rhetoric. But this would be a sad mistake. Before coming, therefore, to the basic subject of this speech this week, we want to reinforce still more emphatically this appraisal, or your recollection, of what it has taken to carry through any appreciable advance in the past and to point out some valuable lessons to be learned from the opening chapter of our history. I plan to do this by a review, which will be quite embarrassing to myself, but I gave up the uh, privilege or the luxury of modesty long ago. It's, uh, I, it's a review of one, spe one specific example out of our general educational activities. Because, in other words, before going on to an outline of a difficult new project on which we shall be working, we want to prepare you to believe that the title to this speech is fully justified. For us to win the whole war in which we are engaged, or even gain any significant advance on any front of that war at any time, 
Please keep always in mind, my friends, that there is no easy way. The nucleus of our illustration is a book called The Politician. Our experience with the private lotter, which grew and grew until it became that book, began in 1954, which was four years before the Society was founded. It has continued right up to this afternoon. In talking about it, however, we shall try to avoid as well as we can a sheer repetition of what so many of you already know by stressing primarily what we have learned from that experience. And we'll keep even that summary as brief as we can. One, we have learned that when the time and the circumstances are appropriate, we must face and expose conspiratorial infiltrations even into the top levels of our government, no matter how much we would prefer to believe that the facts simply are not so. Our fundamental undertaking, so long as the Cold War lasts, is to create a sufficiently deep and widespread understanding of the background, methods, purposes, and menace of the whole master conspiracy. And the politician became in due course one of our strongest and most important opening wedges in that whole educational effort. Two, it should be remembered that the politician was not written for that purpose and was not intended for publication at all. It was disclaimed at the founding meeting of the John Birch Society and again by the Council of the Society when that body was formed a year later. Disclaimed as not having anything to do with the Society or vice versa. And its author, who is your speaker this afternoon, was entirely willing to let that decision prevail. Since the repeatedly expanded letter had been finally completed during the summer of 1956, there had been a very limited but continuous circulation of offset copies of that unpublished manuscript due to the urgent request by good friends who had read it for copies to be loaned on a temporary and confidential basis to friends of their own, with some of which requests we had complied while with others we had not. After the society was founded, we discontinued that practice, pulled in all of the outstanding copies we could reach, and were willing to let this whole episode, or this whole epistolary venture, fade away and be forgotten. All of which we learned in due course, and I'm talking about the things we learned out of our experience with this book, all of this letting it be forgotten, we learned in due course for our future guidance had been an impossibility to accomplish and a mistake to attempt for many reasons. Three, the immediately most important of these reasons was the opportunity thus given, given by the book, to the conspirators to use, so advantageously for themselves, the stratagem which we discussed above. Do not try to refute the accusation, but use it instead to destroy the accuser. So long as there was no chance for the public to read what my book actually said and to discover how thoroughly its statements were backed up by incontrovertible evidence, the insiders and their communist stooges could have a field day by telling everybody over and over that Robert Welch, head of the John Birch Society, had called Eisenhower a communist, which wasn't true in the first place, not believing that he had ever been a member of the Communist Party, but that he had cunningly and ruthlessly served its purposes during his whole career, I had given as one of three possible explanations for his conduct that he was the conscious agent of the communist conspiracy. What was far more important, however, than the usual warping of this tentative description was that these myriad attacks on myself as the accuser almost never gave even a glimmer of any of the facts or the history or the reasoning on which my belief was based. This combination of distortion and smear seemed so effective to the conspirators and their influence over the mass media of communication was already so great that, as we found out by a clipping service, by the early spring of 1963 there were about 1,000 sneering references per day appearing in the newspapers and magazines are being broadcast over the airwaves to contaminate the thinking of the American people about the society and myself. From this experience we learned many things. One was the need for some term with which to identify any man who worked for the communist cause and was high enough up in the conspiratorial apparatus to be an important executive in carrying out communist plans, but probably without ever having been an actual communist himself. And out of that thinking, we eventually developed our present helpful significance for the word insider. But a second benefit was perhaps more vital. We also learned never again to put this criminal conspiracy in position to instigate such an attack on us while our hands were voluntarily tied behind our backs. Four. So, during the fall of 1962, Dr. Francis X. Gannon did a truly fabulous job of digging out the documentation for what had originally been written as a private letter 
with no thought of such supporting references being needed. And on March 10, 1963, the politician was finally published. This was done by myself personally under the name of the Belmont Publishing Company because I did not want anybody else to have to take any responsibility for the book. It was still not the jury, any part of the educational tools or any official concern of the John Birch Society in any way, although by this time the conspirators had succeeded in, ma in making it de facto what they thought would be a permanent liability of the society. But the main point of present interest was that we now learned immediately how complete and how precise the domination by the conspiracy of American press and television had already become. For the very week that the politician appeared, and hence became available for anybody to purchase and to read, an almost unbelievable blanket of silence descended over it. Here was what the press itself had made before publication, probably the most indirectly publicized and most controversial book of the 20th century. Yet, not one single review, good or bad, ever appeared in any of the metropolitan newspapers which had smeared it so long and so mercilessly through just one misquotation. For any such review would have made clear that the book was now out, and thus that anybody who cared enough could arrange to buy a copy, read it, and judge what it said for himself. The book was simply dropped from all mention in print or over the airwaves as if it had never existed. It was a no book. Five. But from the same episode, we also learned something far worse. That was the incredible control which, by influence, infiltration, blackmail, and pressure of many kinds, the conspiracy had acquired over the commercial channels of book distribution throughout the United States. One man in our office took a copy of the politician to the bookstore of the Harvard Cooperative Establishment at Harvard Square, Cambridge. Probably one of the, from, as far as volume goes, one of the largest bookstores in the world. Tremendous turnover of books there. The manager's eyes really lit up when he saw the politician, and even more so when he learned that, this, that his department could make the usual 40% discount on this book, which retailed at $8 per copy. Man, he said, can we sell that? How many do they come to a case? He was told 18 copies. I'll take five cases first, he decided, and at once, and make a display of them right out here on the floor. Now, it happens that the official merchandise manager of the whole cup has to okay all purchases, but and I happen to know he is out at present. But this is just a formality. Come back in an hour, and I'll have the signed order all ready for you. Unquote. Our representative said that was fine. In an hour, he was back. The bookstore manager looked crestfallen, and the general man merchandise manager was with him. The general manager had already reduced the order from 90 copies to 5 copies. Our man started to offer a polite sales argument. Quote, make that 3 copies, snapped the general manager. That's all we're going to buy. Unquote. And it is all of the politician which the cup ever has bought in the 11 years since that time. Your speaker paid around $7,000 for a full-page advertisement in the New York Times announcing publication of the politician and mailed a copy of that advertisement to every one of the 6,810 commercial bookstores in the United States on the list which we had bought. We learned through our members of many such stores that badly wanted to carry the book. But obviously there were various reasons why they did not dare. Very few indeed ventured to go against the pressures. And from that day to this, all of the commercial bookstores in America put together have not bought over 500 copies of The Politician during the whole time when without them, without any of the commercial channels of distribution whatsoever, without them we were selling over a quarter of a million copies ourselves. But it is an ill wind that blows us good. For out of that total experience we learned decisively how important it was to push ahead fast in setting up all of our independent educational media and channels which we had adumbrated in the Blue Book. As both the forces and the pressures of the insiders steadily increased, whereby they thought they could smother all of our educational tools and labors, we proceeded to create our own publishing company, our own bookstore chain, our other channels of distribution for both books and pamphlets, our own periodicals, our own speakers bureau, and all those thousands of ad hoc committees that came to mean so much. We simply had to do so in order for there to be any effective means through which we ourselves and the truly informed patriots who depended on our leadership could reach any really influential audience at all. There was no other way. Today that whole picture is rapidly changing. There are now a thousand commercial bookstores which are regularly selling Western Islands publications 
such as Teddy Bear and Richard Nixon, the man behind the mask. They would even be selling the politician, except for the fact that they mistakenly think it is too far out of date. But it is quite largely our whole new field of educational activity which we created that has made it possible for books like Gary Allen's None Dare Call It Conspiracy and Dan Smoot's The Business End of Government to have any market at all. We can assure you, as can many in this audience who have helped so mightily in making our hopes become realities, that this accomplishment, even no further than it has gone so far, has not been easy. And that without the urgency to which we were prompted by what happened to the politician, it might not have gone half so far nor half so soon. Six, still talking about the things we learned from our experience with this book. One of the most sacred cows of the conspiracy during the middle of this century was Dwight David Eisenhower. As we have pointed out elsewhere, there have been very few men during the past 2,400 years who have rivaled the record of Alcibiades when, as the most eulogized general and politician in Athens, he was actually working for the conspiracy headed by Sparta. This was while the paramount objective of the conspiracy was to destroy the power of Athens and subjugate it to Spartan rule. Yet Eisenhower, playing exactly the same role in a similar contest between his own country and a conspiracy ostensibly headed at that time by the Soviet regime in Russia, far surpassed Alcibiades in the criminality of his conduct. For about 20 years, from 1941 through 1960, Eisenhower engaged continuously in far more massive and infinitely cruel acts of treason to his own country, to its real friends, and to the cause of freedom everywhere than Alcibiades ever had any possibility of performing on behalf of Sparta's plan to establish its fascist tyranny over the whole Greek world. Nevertheless, Eisenhower was so protected and glorified by lying propaganda in his favor and by ruthless suppression of all unfavorable revelations, all of which support was being provided by the already extremely powerful and infinitely evil conspiracy which he was serving, that he remained practically untouchable by the truth for the last 25 years of his life and a considerable time thereafter. This was despite the circumstance that the truth was wide open and readily available to anybody who had the industry and the courage to study the known facts of his career objectively and to put all of the pieces together where they visibly belonged. In the course of putting these pieces together with growing amazement on our own part, we ourselves arrived at a better understanding of how the conspiracy works than we have ever acquired through any other effort. We hope and believe that half a million patriotic Americans so far have been similarly helped, at least to some extent, by simply reading the historical record which our research brought to light. We still say, for instance, that it is not possible to understand what Richard Nixon has really been doing for the past five years without first understanding what Eisenhower did and that it is not possible to defeat the conspiracy without most of our members and through them millions of other good citizens knowing a great deal more of the truth and facing up to a great deal more of the truth than has been accomplished so far about the real character and purposes of the conspiracy and its top insiders, which there is no easy way of bringing to pass. Seven. Finally, to wind up this preparatory section, let us touch briefly on the most important single thing we all have learned, I hope, from this long-continued experience with a book called The Politician, and that is simply the value of being always sure of our facts, or you being sure of your facts. Because if this book in particular, more than any other one we know, had not stood up unscathed after probably the most diligent coving for errors to which any volume has ever been subjected, its publication would have turned into the most devastating blow against the society that we have ever suffered. We do not make these comments because any of us who write or speak or edit for the John Birch Society and its affiliated organizations are, or ever have been, inclined to relax for a minute their or our consuming concern about accuracy. But the politician, so loaded with facts and names and places and specific items of history, has stood up completely and irrefutably, due in part to Dr. Gannon's brilliant and exhaustive help stood up irrefutably under the light of everything about Eisenhower's career, which has come out since its publication, including even Julius Epstein's tremendously researched work on Operation Keelhole. This unshakable reputation of the book for unquestionable accuracy and dependability has been of considerable value to the society in its whole educational program. We have also learned the parallel truth 
that any literature of exposure needs to be full, detailed, and comprehensive enough to present a convincing case. In other words, if you can offer only sketchy opinions about some man or some event when they are of a derogatory nature, it is usually better not to offer them at all. But, to paraphrase George Washington very broadly indeed, do not be afraid to bring the truth to light if and when you can do so with sufficient pains, caution, precision, details, documentation, and thoroughness. That last word, thoroughness, especially, has always been a key to the means and methods used by the John Birch Society in its epic undertaking to create sufficient understanding of the whole conspiracy. We simply do not believe in shortcuts, glancing blows, headline impacts, or that there is any easier way to do the job than what thoroughness requires. Section 3. So we do now come, surprise, to the main theme of this afternoon's speech. We come to uh, th this theme, which we have identified under the heading of, section heading as taxes and tactics. And in this third section of our verbal melange here, we must begin, however reluctantly, with a negative approach. To put it more bluntly, we question both the validity and the wisdom of some of the courses being followed, such as the so-called tax rebellion, by some other good patriots who, like ourselves, are deeply concerned about the dishonest and confiscatory level which has now been reached by contemporary taxation. While in the fourth and final section, we shall offer some proposals of our own, which, although far less dramatic and emotionally stirring, we cannot help feeling are more practicable and constructive. Here are some observations about the present tax situation, therefore, or having some bearing on it, which range from basic and general considerations to transient and specific problems. For this seems to me the best way of stalking quickly through the whole field for discussion that lies directly ahead of us. One, we are facing today a self-perpetuating international master conspiracy nearly 200 years old with the never-changing goal of enslaving the whole human race. In 1848, this conspiracy founded the communist movement, which it has, which it has owned and controlled ever since, and which has now become its most powerful activist arm. In that same year, an intellectual hack of the conspiracy named Karl Marx codified the plans and platform for the new movement into a treatise called the Communist Manifesto. He was considered so important at that time, incidentally, you might remember, that it was 20 years before his name ever showed up on a copy of the Communist Manifesto. That's when they later decided to make him sound important. Two, a graduated income tax was one of the major planks as set forth in that platform for the destruction of any capitalist nation. By the first decade of the 20th century, the United States was obviously destined to become the most powerful, quote, bastion of capitalism, unquote, Lenin's term, I believe, in the world, and many Americans, especially including some leading bankers, were in the top circles of the international conspiracy. And in 1913, these insiders of the master conspiracy succeeded in imposing a graduated income tax on the American people. Three, these insiders had already inaugurated a brilliant plan through the establishment of tax-exempt foundations to protect themselves, their successors, and their wealthiest allies or future recruits from the devastating effect of a graduated income tax. They would thus simply control, by this foundation system, they would control and multiply, but theoretically never own, the vast billions of dollars produced by, the American, by American industry, which would be so which billions would be so extremely useful to them in carrying out all of their other subversive plans. Four, among these plans, which an increasingly confiscatory graduated income tax would help them to consummate were A, the rapid absorption by large business organizations of smaller business enterprises, which would be unable to accumulate out of earnings the capital needed for expansion, are the liquid surplus required to protect themselves from the catastrophe of inheritance tax taxes. I've known many and many a small, middle-sized company that the owner just had to sell out for those reasons. He couldn't face the possibility of uh, the company having to find $700,000 in, in uh, inheritance taxes the minute he died. So he sells out to a bigger company. This was one of the things they planned to bring about. Uh, B, the conversion of big business itself into a multitude of enormous socialistic organizations with all of their power vested in the hands of management instead of ownership. C, the gradual elimination of the middle class altogether. D, the provision to a central government during the whole process of incredible sums of American money 
with which to promote the advance of communism everywhere in the world, most especially including such an advance within the United States. And E, many other means of forwarding the ultimate transformation of the American economic and political system into a communist structure that could be readily merged with the similar structures of other communist-ruled nations. Five, the graduated income tax has been instituted in the United States and then established and then escalated to ruinous levels by almost every kind of lying pretense, false promise, deceptive maneuvers, and legalistic sleight of hand that could be devised by a powerfully entrenched conspiracy and its extremely cunning insiders. Whether or not there is any soundly and honestly arrived at constitutional authority for the Internal Revenue Service to engage in some of the harassments and persecutions of which it is accused in connection with the enforcement of its code for the collection of that tax is a moot question. We suspect that basically it is very much in the same category with questions, questions as to whether the 14th and 15th Amendments were ever legally adopted. But the 16th Amendment and the very tricky assumption that the graduated feature of the income tax is permitted by that amendment have been accepted almost completely for a long time by the American people as the law of the land. And up till now, anyway, Americans have always been basically law-abiding citizens. So for these reasons and other reasons we shall come to, we simply are not convinced that a concerted tax revolt offers the way to any net accomplishment at the present time that is at all worthwhile. Six, if a fully informed and patriotic individual has the courage and the will to refuse to pay his income tax as a means of dramatizing the unfair, unwise, and un-American nature of that tax, or the treacherous purposes, dramatizing the treacherous purposes for which the money thus garnered is being used, we say more power to him. When Dr. William C. Douglas of Florida did that a few years ago, we expressed our applause by having him as one of the head table guests at our New York dinner that December. And even though it turned out that Dr. Douglas had not been as realistic in his action as we had thought when he later showed so much surprise on landing in jail <coughs> as he certainly should have expected, nevertheless, we do not regret at all having shown our admiration for his daring spirit. Seven, but for anybody to set himself up as one of the instigators and leaders of an organized tax revolt is quite a different matter. To try to persuade other people to engage in such concerted action against what is considered by 99% of the American people as currently the law, <laughs> no matter how much they may resent it, is to use conspiratorial methods in opposing a conspiracy. And whether or not there is something admirable about such a quixotic undertaking or endeavor, we think that for many reasons under present circumstances, it is the wrong approach to a serious problem. Eight. One reason for our attitude is the expected futility of any such undertaking. To the best of our admittedly limited knowledge of the subject, there, have never, there has never been a successful tax revolt against a fully established government except when the tax resistance was used as the spark and means for bringing on a military revolt as happened in the American Revolution. And we doubt if any of the present advocates of a tax rebellion <coughs> are yet ready to stick their necks out by becoming leaders of or participants in a military revolution against the administration in Washington. Nine, certainly if we are to be guided by experience, the tax revolt now contemplated, or perhaps we should say now underway, is doomed to failure. This is shown by the result of Pujatism in France some two decades ago. By that time, the whole system of French taxation was as fully opp oppressive and nearly confiscatory as ours is today. So a man named Pujad organized a tax revolt, much in the same manner and on the same, of the same nature that various patriotic and ambitious friends of ours are trying to advance in the United States. The movement created great excitement and was reported to have acquired at least a million followers, although how many of that million ever actually refused to pay their own taxes was obviously a different matter, a different story. But the whole crusade eventually petered out with little except a lot of noise and turmoil accomplished by the effort. And we are simply not convinced that a similar campaign in our country today would produce any better results. Ten, there are still other reasons, some of them of a more fundamental nature, 
for our lack of enthusiasm about this incipient rebellion. But it will be more logical to present them in section 4 as antitheses to our alternative suggestions. So let us merely pause further here to make clear some conciliatory aspects of our thinking about this subject. For the John Birch Society is just as bitterly opposed as anybody else to every feature of the Marxist program, including the graduated income tax, or even just simply the exorbitant level of that tax in 1974. And of course, we could be wrong about the way to fight such tyrannical taxation. We certainly make no claim to omniscience about anything. So we are not being presumptuous enough to tell anybody to stay out of the tax revolt movement if their own consciences or judgments tell them instead that this is a good battle in which to engage. But we have honestly told our members, as we now remind them here, that the tax rebellion is not a project of the John Birch Society and that we personally think the time and resources and energy required for that project could be used far more effectively in other ways of opposing the designs and practice, practices of the conspiracy. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we think that Willis Stone has been more surely and soundly on the right track for a forward march against destructive taxation with his attempt to bring into play the Liberty Amendment. For we believe it is... For we believe it is important to have more and more of the American people become aware that A, the graduated income tax in both background and purpose is entirely of communist design for destruction of the American economic system. And B, this tax is not at all necessary to the proper functioning of the American government. Unfortunately, the ideological and political cards have been stacked too heavily against the Liberty Amendment for Willis Stone or anybody else to have put it over during recent years. But every bit of educational efforts to that end is well worthwhile. We have maintained support of this educational feature of the Liberty Amendment drive as an official project of the John Birch Society since even before it was called by that name Liberty Amendment, and we still expect to do so. But we do not think that either our goals or the educational work to reach them have to be limited to or dependent on or wait for the political success of a tax revolt or the Liberty Amendment or any other campaign now on the horizon. So let's move into the fourth and final section of this analytical outlook, which will be more on the positive side. Section four. We can probably best summarize our own proposals and their, in, in, their encompassing project in the slogan, lower taxes through less government. And And again, we shall try to shorten and simplify the argument by a series of heterogeneous points. One, we do not have to wait until we win some one grand and shattering victory, such as adoption of the Liberty Amendment and abolition of the graduated income tax altogether, before doing something emphatic about reducing the present astronomical amount of taxes that are being literally stolen from the American people. And there are other ways to work steadily for sizable and continuous reductions besides striking against paying any taxes at all. It is in tune with the whole policy of the John Birch Society to accept the fact that there is no easy way to achieve such a sharp and decisive abolition of whole elements of the tax structure. But we can work hard and continuously towards that end by our usual methods of education which lead to effective protests through both public opinion and political action. Two, the present mood of the American people, created by so much fear and resentment at the way taxes have risen to such an oppressive height in just five or six years under the Nixon administration, makes such an educational program in this field more timely and realistic than ever before. And what we need most to bring about some gradual but increasingly beneficial results of such a program is to convince more and more of the American people of just two things. A that no such astronomical revenue from taxation is actually needed by the federal government at all, and b, that this whole trend to ever more exorbitant and ruinous taxation without such need or justification is being deliberately promoted by insiders of the master conspiracy for destructive purposes. Three, the second of these aims is particularly within the province and, we are sorry to say, almost exclusively within the activities of the John Birch Society. Not long ago, your speaker this afternoon had the pleasure of attending in Washington 
a dinner in honor of that great American, and incidentally a member of our council, Dean Clarence Mannion. The 500 people present included six or seven conservative senators, about the same number of conservative congressmen, scores of top-level military men, and other leaders of very, very varied backgrounds and connections in patriotic American activities, and was described from the podium as being the most prestigious gathering of American conservatives that had ever been assembled in one room at any time. There were many short preliminary talks by those at the head table, followed by a long and excellent major speech of Senator Jesse Helms, and then by an equally able and serious response from the guest of honor himself. And I agreed with everything they said. But, ladies and gentlemen, I most assuredly did not agree with what they didn't say, with their omissions. For well over two hours, we listened to some superb delineations of what is wrong in our country today and what ought to be done about it. But not once during that whole time did we hear the words conspiracy or communist even mentioned. At one point, Dean Mannion listed the forms of government, including socialism and communism, to which our present trends lead. But with that single exception, there was no slightest attention paid to the crux of the real problem at all, which is simply that all of these horrible things now happening to us have been planned and plotted to happen and are being steadily advanced to more horrible and incredible extremes by the communists and their bosses above them whom we call the insiders. This attitude, my friends, is not only a mistake, it is the biggest mistake being made by conservatives as a whole today and with few exceptions for the past 30 years. And it is exactly what the insiders want. As we have pointed out before, the communists are absolutely sure of winning if all of their opposition can be kept on an ideological plane. They are so sure of this that their liberal angels will even subsidize your opposition to them and help it to grow if you still fight them only in an ideological and political terms. Because under those conditions, they can throw into their side of the scales, on top of their ideological arguments and propaganda, all of the secret pressures, dirty tricks, and vicious crimes, which are the main part of their strength and their strategy. This is, this is how they still make everybody, or almost everybody, think that they are winning more and more power and prestige through increasing public acceptance of various ideological features of their program. It is imperative, therefore, that the John Birch Society and all of its most dedicated members take the lead in pointing out the hands and plans of the conspiracy at work behind so many destructive movements that are underway. The drive, for instance, to enforce the idiotic busing of children away from their neighborhood schools, supposedly to overcome racial imbalance, is not due in the final analysis to either misguided idealism nor political demagoguery, even though both of these skillfully induced attitudes are cunningly utilized by the insiders to put their nefarious plan into effect. Racial justice, friendly coexistence on truly equal terms, and such social intermingling as may be actually desired by both races is the last thing on earth that these conspirators really want. What they are after is exactly the opposite. Namely, all of the bitterness, resentment, distrust, and even militant hostility by ignorant and gullible hotheads on both sides, which this busing scheme can help to bring about. Very similar considerations apply to all the present activities of conspiratorial plotters behind the scenes to demoralize, discredit, and stultify our local police forces. The real objective of the insiders, of course, through all of these methods and means which we have been forecasting for years, is to facilitate their establishment of a national Gestapo. You can find parallels to these tricky schemes in a dozen other fields of activity, from welfareism here at home to our subsidization of communist phonies calling themselves social democrats, or by other misleading names, all over the world. And above all, you will find the same principles true with regard to the taxation now being imposed on American industry and the American people. So it behooves all of us, Birches, not only to call a spade a spade with regard to who and what is behind all of these terrible things that are happening to our country, but to apply that rule with special emphasis in connection with taxation. Use your own knowledge and experience and do your own research to whatever extent is practicable while making sure that you turn to sound sources for such digging and absolutely sure that you have your facts correct and your interpretations reasonable in everything that you write, quote, or otherwise expound on this subject, as of course on all subjects. And making equally sure ourselves, we should try to be of more specific help to you 
when and after we get this project called Lower Taxes Through Less Government officially underway in our July Bulletin. Four, this brings us to a most distasteful series of paragraphs which we feel obliged to insert into our present monologue. It is a warning that not all of the, quote, literature, unquote, being issued by some of the tax revolt advocates is entirely dependable. We do not intend for this to be a slur at all on the leadership of the tax rebellion as a whole. There are quite a number of smart men behind this movement, and everybody that we know to be supporting it is a patriotic American. But let us illustrate the concern we are trying to ventilate here by re referring to a pamphlet which we shall call Overkill, not its name at all, written and published by a man whom we shall call Mr. Y, which obviously is not his name at all either. Now even if we used Mr. Y's right name, most of you in this audience would never have heard of him. Some would, but most of you wouldn't. But he is fairly well known in some sections of the country. This particular pamphlet, one of a periodical series which he has been publishing for years, contains 24 pages, 8.5 inches by 11 inches, printed mostly in about 9-point type. In its 20,000 words, more or less, there are many sound arguments against the tax tyranny that is afflicting all of us with increasing severity every year. But the reason why we have dubbed this pamphlet Overkill can be brought out quickly in this very brief review by the following example. On page 17, a supposedly important paragraph begins with these two sentences. Quote, Many do not know that the Liberty Bell was not first rung to celebrate our political independence from the King of England. It was first rung 20 years earlier to proclaim financial independence from the Rothschild-controlled Bank of England. Unquote. Now it is true that the Liberty Bell brought over from England was recast in Philadelphia in 1753. So it could easily have been rung in 1756, 20 years before our Declaration of Independence, in celebration of some patriotic protest or activity of the kind that eventually led to the American Revolution. But in 1756, my friends, the time when this man said that the bell was rung in uh, protest against the, con the control of the Rothschild-controlled Bank of England, control in America, in 1756, Meyer Amschel, founder of the House of Rothschild, was a boy 13 years old. It was still 45 years before even Meyer Amschel was to receive any official recognition of importance, even at home, by being appointed financial advisor in 1801 to the Landgrave of Hesse Castle. The one of his sons, Nathan Meyer Amschel, who eventually founded the family branch in England, and therefore did eventually have some influence with the Bank of England, the Meyer, uh, Nathan, Amschel, uh, Nathan Meyer Amschel was not even born until 1777, one year after our Declaration of Independence and 21 years after the date when, according to Mr. Y, the American colonists were proclaiming their, quote, financial independence from the Rothschild-controlled Bank of England, unquote. It was largely to prevent such wild statements and incredible distortions of history on the part of our fellow compatriots in the anti-communist cause that we republished a few years ago Count Egon Corti's superbly detailed and documented history about the rise of the House of Rothschild. For in due course, the sons of Meyer Amschel were cooperating with each other very closely, while each one was established as an important financier in a different country. Thus they began to set the pattern of working on both sides of all wars, which policy has since become so important a part of the strategy of the whole conspiracy. By 1815, Nathan Rothschild had indeed acquired a powerful influence with the Bank of England, and the other brothers were also prospering mighty well in their respective areas. And by the time the Rothschild brothers had survived the insurrections and disorders of 1830, which the conspiracy itself had fomented, there is no doubt that they were well on their way to becoming very important members of that conspiracy themselves. The role which the whole family has played since then as increasingly important insiders of this increasingly powerful and ruthless international master conspiracy needs far more detailed study and revelation than it has ever been given. But Mr. Y is certainly not the man to undertake that task for the rest of us. There is no easy way for us anti-communists to convince a skeptical public of the truth about the Rothschilds anyhow. And a book by Mr. Y might only make it a great deal harder. Because unfortunately, like Myron Fagan before him and Dr. Stuart Crane today, among many others, Mr. Y does not believe in studying any history before he starts spouting it. They seem to feel that if there is something which fits conveniently into the sensationalism they are seeking to provide, but about which they do not really know the facts, 
then nobody else knows those facts either, so they can say anything they want to with impunity. And they do so with such pontifical pretenses to both knowledge and wisdom as most of us would not even dream of claiming about any subject after years of studying it intensively. Actually, the matter covered in these last few paragraphs and Mr. Wise's mistakes about it are not of any extravagant importance. We have taken the trouble to discuss them simply as exhibits leading up to something else because this whole issue of overkill is shot through with sloppy history, sloppy English, and sloppy emotionalism parading as logic. And there is one other sample of his forensic production which is of very basic importance indeed. It deals with a subject which concerns us vitally tonight. Also, while Mr. Y presents the arguments involved as if the whole theme originated with himself, he takes this erroneous history and what seem to us to be the unsound conclusions, both of which he has merely dressed up more gaudily with a few extravagances of his own, from a published book which we shall call Insurrection by a far more scholarly writer whom we shall call Dr. X. We shall not further identify Dr. X because his book contains a great deal of excellent material on the grievances behind and the participants in the tax rebellion. And we do not want to be any more critical of him than we can help. But we did want to go on record as being aware that the following line of thought to which we object so strenuously was made much more serious through being backed by this more substantial author. After which interpolation, let us clarify what we are talking about by quoting the first paragraph at the beginning of page 6 in Mr. Wise's pamphlet, headed by an astounding title, The Federalist Conspiracy. This passage reads as follows. The Federalist Conspiracy, and I might warn you by Federalist, he's referring to the Federalist Papers to Hamilton and Washington and Adams and the Federalists of the 1770 to 1800 period, 1780 to 1800 period. Uh, quote, The Federalist Conspiracy is far from new, for it began even before the United States Constitution was formally ratified. One of these early conspirators was Alexander Hamilton, who we now know was an agent of the Rothschild-controlled Bank of England. For nearly 200 years, these men have had but one ambition, to establish strong central governments whose destiny they could control through the power of taxation and central banks." Unquote. In other words, the long, infinitely evil movement begun by Adam Weishaupt and his Illuminati in 1776, which made its first great stride towards destroying Western civilization by playing so mighty a part in bringing on the Holocaust of the French Revolution, which has continued its ever more deadly subversive undertaking through other wars and other revolutions and other means right up to the present time, and which we ourselves have called, simply for lack of a better name, the Great Conspiracy, this most foul, far-reaching, and satanic plot in all human history has been renamed by Mr. Y, at least so far as all of its impact on the American nation and the American people is concerned, as the Federalist Conspiracy. And there then follow some 2,000 words blaming all of the evils we have suffered from that conspiracy for the last five generations on the Federalists in the days of George Washington and John Adams, and primarily on Alexander Hamilton as the one great villain of the plot and, in fact, of all American history. We find it solemnly stated, for instance, that, quote, as a result of Andrew Jackson's stand against Federalist conspiracy, his name is taught to be hated in every schoolroom in America, unquote. Or that, quote, by 1900, these Federalist forces had gained control of the United States government, unquote. And in all capitals, uh, in all capitals that, quote, yet this Federalist conspiracy is so powerful today that they have kept this liberty amendment from even being voted on for 12 years, unquote. This is about the worst collection of half-baked nonsense that your present speaker has ever come across. All of the history advanced to support it is about on a par with the references, uh, references above to Hamilton as, quote, an agent of the Rothschild-controlled Bank of England, unquote. One of the many things wrong with that statement is that when Hamilton was killed by Aaron Burr in 1804, it is doubtful if the Bank of England had ever yet even ever heard of the Rothschilds. And the hatred of Alexander Hamilton manifested so arrogantly here grows out of the following well-known facts. For a decade after the American Revolution got underway, the colonies had struggled along under the extremely loose-knit Articles of Confederation. Washington and John Adams and Hamilton and most other statesmen of the time wanted to convert this hodgepodge arrangement into the framework of a powerful nation. They succeeded in doing so at the convention called in 1787 for that purpose. Hamilton did more than any other one man to iron out all of the objections and disagreements and thus get the new Constitution of the United States ratified in due course by all 13 colonies. Hamilton then set out 
as Secretary of the Treasury under Washington as our first president, and with the full support of both Washington and Adams, to bring some order and stability out of the incredible financial mess in which both the separate states and the, con and the Confederation had found themselves by the time the revolution was won and in the years immediately thereafter. The currency issued by the Continental Congress, for instance, had become so valueless that, quote, not worth a Continental, unquote, has come down as a stock phrase in our language. To bring the order and stability we have just mentioned out of that chaotic situation, Hamilton badly needed, in fact had to have, and succeeded in establishing a national bank. And with it he also succeeded in his substantive purpose of putting the new nation and its currency on a solid basis. But Hamilton's use of this bank for the great and very real need at that time was no more parallel to the establishment of the Federal Reserve System for entirely different purposes a little over a hundred years later than George Washington's strengthening of the presidency and of the new government of the new nation was a part of any desire by Washington to become a king. Now our reason for going so sketchily and inadequately into this bit of history connected with the early days of our republic is that some misinterpretation of some of that history being disseminated by some of the tax revolt enthusiasts is going to create real obstacles to any sound tax reform in this country if it is allowed to go unrefuted. And we are not talking about their incredible vilification of Alexander Hamilton, nor the even more incredible build-up and glorification of Thomas Jefferson, except as those attitudes derive from what seems to us to be a massive misunderstanding of and frightening sympathy for the French Revolution itself. But their social, political, and economic theories can constitute a very difficult obstacle to overcome in our effort or any effort to start our country moving towards a really sound policy of taxation, as we hope to make clear in the final and most substantive points to be discussed tonight. So let's return in starting on this next stretch to the more positive aspects of our own proposed campaign for lower taxes through less government. One, we now repeat what we stated near the beginning of an earlier section that no such astronomical revenue from taxation as is currently being collected is actually needed at all by our federal government. One reason is the sheer deliberate calculated waste of money for no other purpose than getting rid of it by so many agencies of that government. Your speaker, tremendously shocked and amazed at the time, first ran into the embryonic development of this practice in the spring of 1948. At that time, I happened to hold the highest elective office in the National Association of American Candy Manufacturers and also to be chairman of its National Legislative Committee, which was actually called the Washington Committee. And so I was in constant touch with a great many government agencies, especially including the Food and Drug Administration and the Federal Trade Commission. Early in the spring of 1948, I was approached by two officials of the United States Department of Commerce, they had dreamed up a service which they wanted to perform on behalf of all candy manufacturers. It was one of those fact-finding monstrosities which, it seemed to me, would not serve any useful purpose. Nevertheless, at their insistence, I arranged to let them present it to the next full meeting of the association's board of directors. The directors felt exactly the same way as I had about this proposal, so they tried to brush it aside in a friendly manner by agreeing to take the offer under consideration. After which nothing happened, of course. But the Department of Commerce people were really persistent. They almost wore me out, urging greater positive support on my part for their project. Until finally one day I said to them, Look, gentlemen, you know and I know that carrying out this project would cost each candy manufacturer a lot of time and therefore money in just handling the bureaucratic requirements of this fact-finding operation without doing any of us one bit of good yet you are determined to allocate several hundred thousand dollars of the government's money to putting it over. Do you mind telling me why? One of them looked at the other one, who nodded, and the first one then said, quote, Mr. Welch, you have been very frank and fair with us, and I believe that we can be equally frank with you on a confidential basis. We are on a spot. As you know, the government's fiscal year will come to an end on June 30th, and in our little corner of the Department of Commerce... We have several hundred thousand dollars which we simply must get rid of by that time. Just as must also be done by other groups in the department with extra money for which they are responsible. And unless we can all find plausible ways to spend that money, the whole department's appropriation for next year will be cut down to below what it was this year. So we are asking your help in doing our part to keep that from happening. Unquote. They didn't get it, the help. 
for I am sure that hundreds of different bureaucratic groups and agencies were successful in similar undertakings. I am also sure that all of the millions spent that year in this manner were just peanuts compared to the increasingly enormous sums which have been deliberately wasted on such boondoggles since then and are being wasted at still higher levels today. I know of one case some years back where the sum of $3 billion was involved. The number and the amount which could be dug out by patient research would boggle your mind. And just putting an end to this practice alone would go a long way towards making the graduated income tax completely unnecessary. Two, but that is only the beginning of the answers which can be provided to those who say to you, quote, of course we do not like the income tax, but where on earth is the government going to get the money needed to operate without it, unquote. For the real comprehensive answer, of course, is that there is no such need at all if we return to an American political and economic system instead of continuing to approach the communist system. And that point brings us at long last to the real reason why I have reluctantly dragged the tax revolt advocates into so much of this discussion. For some of them, without being at all aware of what they are doing, are really supporting communist plans. Mr. Y's mentor, Dr. X, for instance, writes in one of his books of the rising French bourgeoisie of the last half of the 18th century, quote, This economic group, however, because of its intellectual vigor, was able to accumulate considerable wealth and project a convincing revolutionary philosophy in the works of Voltaire, Rousseau, and the Encyclopedists, unquote. Remember, that's the bourgeoisie he's talking about, the rising bourgeoisie in France. Further along, he says, with obvious approval, quote, in July 1789, the Paris mob attacked and destroyed the Bastille, where thousands of political prisoners had been tortured and executed. Shortly thereafter, they stormed the royal palace, known as the Tuileries. In due course, Louis XVI, Queen Marie Antoinette, and many thousands of their nobles and supporters were laid silently to rest under the guillotine, unquote. Dr. X's history, apparently, comes out of the pro-communist propaganda that has been parading his history with more and more overwhelming success, especially in Western Europe and the United States, for the past hundred years. We should like to suggest that he read Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robeson and the four volumes by Abbe Baruel, both published in 1798, and then all of the exhaustively documented books of Nestor Webster published in the first decades of our own century, and scores of other books produced during the generations since the French Revolution, which noble men and women have brought out the cost of their careers and frequently of their lives. He might then learn something of the real conspiratorial origin and brutalitarian results of both the philosophy and the event which he records with so much gratification. It would be very easy, and we should like very much, to show how utterly mistaken are the interpretations of history in just the two passages we have quoted. But it would take far too much time for a fully documented exposure of the errors, falsehoods, and distortions through long-continued propaganda which have been accepted by Dr. X in just those two short passages. Especially would it take too much time to convince him or other uninformed doubters that the revolution which he is praising there was run by exactly the same self-perpetuating group of criminal conspirators that we are facing in America today, and, while, and which is right now perpetrating the same horrible murders, treason, and other crimes in Cuba and Portugal and China and so much of Africa for the very same purpose of increasing the power of this conspiratorial clique until it rules the whole population of the earth as its miserable slaves. So let's go on at once to what matters in Dr. X's book for our immediate concern. This is his horrible belief, as made clear at many places throughout that book, that it is the function of government to provide and ensure the welfare of its people. This is in tune, all right, with the pretenses of the conspirators who perpetrated the Holocaust of the French Revolution. It is the entire pretense and the ostentatiously claimed philosophy of all the communist tools and the actual bosses at the top of the same conspiracy today, five generations later. But it is exactly and completely contrary to what Americans have always believed and to the principles of government and of economics which enable the United States to become the best environment for human life that our poor, fumbling human race has ever reached. Dr. X and many of his impetuous fellow tax revolters do not really believe that the sole function of government is to protect the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness on the part of its citizens. He believes instead that it is the duty and function of government to provide that happiness, to provide it for them, or at least to provide all the features of a government-produced setting 
in which they had better be happy by golly or the government will send them to concentration camps. It is for this reason we believe, accepted unconsciously and not thought through to its real significance at all by these basically good people, that their present opposition to taxes has taken such a confusing form. For on reading some parts of Dr. X's book carefully, you will find that he has no objection whatsoever to the real basis and cause of all our troubles, which is simply our permitting the government to play the role of Santa Claus. In fact, Dr. X wants the government to be Santa Claus. Dr. X merely objects to the kind of bag in which our Santa Claus currently carries his goodies. He, Dr. X, seems to have no recognition that, as Tom Anderson, among others, has pointed out so emphatically, a government which can give you everything must be in position to take everything away, to take it away from you and give it to somebody else in accordance with the whims or self-interest of the politicians in charge of that government. Further careful reading of this best-known book today in support of a tax rebellion discloses that Dr. X does not really advocate abolition or drastic reduction of confiscatory taxes at all. He wants to reduce the upper limit of the graduated income tax to what he thinks, from his particular perspective on the economic scene, is the right level. And if the government, to provide enough goodies so that everybody at least ought to be happy, needs the revenue from the graduated income tax beyond or above what he thinks is the right level, then the government should raise that money by installing instead a nationwide retail sales tax of perhaps 10%. And we could go on for quite a while with what seemed to us to be numerous incongruities and even extreme absurdities in the come-on publicity for the tax revolt show. But that's enough, we believe, to demonstrate that Dr. X and we Birches simply do not speak the same language. We do not go all of, all of the way with the extreme libertarians, both because we believe that some reasonable measure of government is necessary in any civilized social organization, with even some interference as to our individual rights and responsibilities about which it is not easy to draw the line, and also because we believe that our disastrous economic developments of recent years have not been due at all to economic fallacies, but to the deliberate plans of ruthless conspirators to bring about those disasters for their own sinister purposes. We do believe very earnestly, however, that allowing any government to step materially out of its purely negative role of simply providing law and order and protection for its citizens and to move over into the positive role and paternalistic function of being the provider of the necessities and comforts and luxuries of life, we believe that this course, unless the people have the sense and courage to reverse that trend in time, will lead inevitably to two things. A, the transformation of a land of abundance with millions of salesmen always trying to move the too much into a land of scarcity, with millions of ration clerks always trying to divide the too little. And B, a second inevitable result, the transformation of a free country into an absolute dictatorship with a merciless police force needed to maintain such tyranny. We further believe that exorbitant taxation under the pretense of thus benefiting the people is one of the most criminal and efficacious means any conspiracy can use for bringing about these transformations. We believe that we should be doing everything that is morally right and politically wise to prevent it. And this certainly does not rule out a tax revolt under all conditions at any time or all times by any means. But there are all kinds of pitfalls to be guarded against in our program as in any other. For one thing, there will be left-wing politicians by the dozen. There already are some who may have been brought out of the woodwork by the noise of a pending tax revolt who will want to climb aboard any bandwagon driven towards tax reduction but with a firm idea in their own minds of supplying the government even more money with even worse effects on our country through deficit spending and a higher national debt. These and similar perversions of our effort by double-crossing hangers-on must be diligently avoided. But the whole essence of our drive will be summed up in that phrase, lower taxes through less government, because reducing the power and functions and activities of government by at least 50%, which is our present goal for the foreseeable future, is even more important in the long run than stopping the pain of having our money stolen from us by agents of the conspiracy. Whatever we can accomplish in this endeavor, therefore, every tiny gain we can make will serve a double purpose and will lead to greater gains in the future. The mechanics of this project will be largely educational, of course, but they will also be reinforced by practical efforts to obtain some prompt benefits from that education. We shall start setting forth 
those mechanics in our July bulletin, we shall be striving not for fireworks, but steady accomplishment. As members of the John Birch Society, we shall be sustained in our effort by the knowledge from experience that to achieve so worthy and important an end, there is no easy way. But as Birches, we shall also be inspired by the conviction that it can be done. And now, my friends, we are almost through. Four hours yet? <laughs> Long enough. And now, my friends, we are almost through. Please allow us a few paragraphs, or at most a few minutes, to summarize this long dissertation. Then you can relax, at least briefly, from so many serious thoughts. We have spent a great deal of time in talking about the embryonic tax revolt, even though we expect it to become an abortion. One reason for so much attention to it is that, of course, we could be wrong, and that in any case it is a current development of considerable importance. A second reason is that so much of the supporting literature being issued by advocates of this tax rebellion is full of such incredible misunderstanding, shallowness, and distortion of both the history and the economic principles involved. It was our intention to go into considerably more detail in this speech about their dangerous fallacy in glorifying the leadership methods and purposes of the French Revolution, apparently without recognizing that these were all manifestations of the very same infinitely evil and self-perpetuating conspiracy which we are facing in America today. And also, to go into more details about their extremely confusing habit of giving such fulsome praise to the leading supporter of that French Revolution in our country, namely Thomas Jefferson, while condemning so violently the Herculean efforts of Washington, Adams, and Hamilton to keep Jefferson from planning both the ideas and organization of the Jacobinical leaders in the United States. But I find, to my delighted surprise, that Bill Fall has covered this ground adequately and well in his foreword to our June Bulletin. So we merely urge, uh, emphatically, as, as emphatically as we can, that all of you read that foreword to the June Bulletin very carefully if you have not already done so. And we go on directly to our third and most important reason for so much conversation about the tax revolt, which is that it offered both the best and the most timely illustration we could find with which to clarify the real theme of this speech as indicated by its title. And we leave the tax revolt argument for good at last by quoting a wisecrack invented by somebody which I love to apply to myself whenever I feel an urgent need for shattering my own pomposity. The wisecrack reads as follows. The people who think they know everything certainly are aggravating to those of us who do. <laughs> and after that confession, we come to the final point. It has been the contention of the John Birch Society throughout the 15 years of our existence that there is no easy way to defeat and destroy the conspiracy which seeks to make slaves out of some 97% of the whole human race. At the same time, we know that it can be exposed and scattered to the wind by our long, hard educational labors. Let's look at some recent and very encouraging signs. We are sure that our special letter-writing campaign made the difference that spelled defeat to the Land Use Bill by a vote of 211 to 204. <laughs> when that most communistic piece of legislation ever to be presented seriously to an American Congress last came up again. During recent months, our educational program has had a similar effect on the Equal Rights Amendment, on the Genocide Treaty, on any full diplomatic recognition of Red China, and on the continuing attempt of the American Indian movement to set up one or more Soviet governments within our borders. None of these reverses are at all fatal to the conspiracy, but enough of them surely would be, and enough such setbacks for it can be accomplished with education as our total strategy and truth as our only weapon if we will only work hard enough at the job and bring in enough new recruits to help us. This is because time and history and human nature are all on our side. The chances that we shall win seem to me today to be about even. But the chances that we can win 
if we put sufficient labor, sacrifice, and resolution into the effort, are far more favorable than that. As we said on the last page of the Blue Book 15 years ago, quote, all we must find and build and use to win is sufficient understanding. Let's create that understanding and build that resistance with everything mortal men can put into the effort while there still is time, unquote. Also, my friends, it has just occurred to me that early tomorrow morning would be a very propitious occasion for each of you to get back on that job with renewed vigor and increased determination. And may God be with you till we meet again. <laughs>